Hello, my name is Aiden Rupert, and yes, I am wearing this Oakland A's sweatshirt, ironically. Alongside me is my good friend Rob Murray, and welcome to episode three of the WCHC Sports Podcast, where we discuss the latest news and updates from around the sports world. Since you're here, be sure to subscribe to our WCHC Sports 88.1 FM YouTube page, where you can expect weekly updates on all things sports. Today, Rob and I will be talking about the New York Giants' recent signing of Holy Cross football alum De- Jackson Dennis, Damian Lillard and the Portland Trailblazers' race to the NBA's Western Conference playoffs, a bench-clearing brawl between the A's and Astros, and more. Rob, what a week we've had here in sports. You're right, Aiden. It's perhaps been the best week yet, in my opinion. It's had everything from stellar performances, down-to-the-wire games, heated rivalries, and like you said, a Holy Cross alum making some waves in the pro sports world. So it's days like these that really make me so glad that sports are finally back. Absolutely. Could not agree more. But before we get started, we at WCHC Sports must acknowledge the college's difficult decision to cancel an in-person semester for fall 2020. For us, this confirms what we had feared. WCHC Sports will not have the opportunity to provide live coverage of Holy Cross athletics for the next several months. Rest assured, however, that we fully expect to move forward with the WCHC Sports Podcast, among other initiatives. Please contact wchcsports at g.holycross.edu with any comments, questions, or concerns. So we've had a super entertaining week in the world of the NBA. Let's talk a little bit about the bubble recap from this past week as we move into the postseason, who's in and who is out. So as mentioned during last week's podcast, we already knew the eight teams that we would end up seeing represent the Eastern Conference. Out West, however, we've witnessed one of the wildest playoff races that we have seen in years, and it's not quite done yet. The Portland Trailblazers, who controlled their own destiny following Damian Lillard's Herculean 61-point effort in a victory against Dallas, won another thriller last night against the Brooklyn Nets 134-133. And Karis LeVert, who has been absolutely outstanding throughout bubble play, just missed a step-back game winner on the last possession that would have sent Lillard and the Blazers packing. And I don't know about you, but I thought that shot was dropping. Absolutely. That was going down 99 times out of 100. And with the way LeVert was playing, I was shocked that he didn't nail it. Absolutely. He has developed into one of the premier mid-range players in the entire NBA he sort of has a throwback vibe to his game in that regard but Lillard got the last laugh and he was once again unbelievable and scored 42 points on eight of 14 shooting from three including including some absolutely unbelievable makes such as the one I think in the third or fourth quarter from the logo Um, so the Blazers on their part they'll have a chance to solidify their standing as the eighth and final seed out West as Saturday, they have a play in game against the Memphis Grizzlies. So how that works is they have two chances to win one game against the Memphis Grizzlies Memphis. If they win Saturday, will have their chance to enter into the playoff picture with a win Sunday. With the Memphis Grizzlies, you know, I think they'll be left wondering if they can't pull off these two wins against Portland what could have been they seemed firmly locked into the western conference playoff picture whether that uh was the eighth seed or even a possible vault up to the seventh seed but you know they really struggled at the beginning they were able to salvage a few games there at the end um, and with the way the blazers are playing right now i'm i'm sure the grizzlies aren't feeling as confident as they should have been going into the postseason i think there was certainly an opportunity missed there they were a young team i give them a lot of credit for being where they were at the start of the bubble John Morant, we've talked about him before on the podcast. He was sensational all year. Um, And who knows, Memphis could find something uh, late in the season here and turn it around and meet LeBron in the first round. But I I agree with you. I think Portland has been one of the more stellar teams in the bubble behind our Phoenix Suns, of course. We'll get to them in a little bit. But um, I'm certainly excited for these next two games, possibly one between the Grizzlies and the Blazers. Uh, But with that being said, another underlying uh, story that might be ignored throughout all this is that the San Antonio Spurs, who were hovering around that eighth spot with the Suns and the Blazers and the Grizzlies, are missing out on the playoffs for the 
first time in 23 years. 1997 was the last time they missed out. They got Tim Duncan right after. They had David Robinson, Tony Parker, Ginobili. I mean, they, they were a model franchise, a perennial contender for two decades. Uh, and seeing them out of that playoff bracket is, is almost a little surreal, given that, you know, Aiden, you and I, we grew up watching the Spurs dominate the West and win multiple titles uh, against LeBron James twice. Um, they beat Kobe Bryant in a few playoff series, Kevin Durant, Westbrook. So seeing a, a true dynasty almost come to an end uh, is is shocking. You never thought the Spurs would, would uh, peter out like they did now, especially with Greg Popovich at the helm. You know, it was tough to watch, and I wouldn't go so far as to, to describe it as shocking just because of their roster construction this year. It was going to be an uphill battle. Um, you talk about stylistically, their roster centered around the scoring of LaMarcus Aldridge and DeMar DeRozan appears to be a thing of yesterday, given their um, their liking for mid-range shooting. But that said, I agree with you. It was deflating, and just watching the clock tick down on their season during that game yesterday, it just made me realize what we've been taking for granted for, you know, longer than we've even been alive. And I've sort of enjoyed some of this internet chatter about just how different the world was back in 1997. I mean, we're talking about pre-social media, pre-Google even. Uh, Titanic was just debuting in theaters. Kobe Bryant, you just mentioned, his battles with the Spurs. Kobe Bryant was a rookie in 1996-97 so definitely somehow shocking somehow deflating um but the spurs i wouldn't even go so far as to count them out for next year though just saying you could be right um but for now i think it was a very funereal vibe surrounding the spurs and the end of their season it reminded me of seeing the new england patriots lose the titans at home in the wild card game this past winter, it was something you felt was eventually coming, given the Patriots' uh, decline over the past season or two. But when it finally happened, you just couldn't believe it because you were so used to seeing a team so well run, so well coached, um, just dominant on the field go out like that. Yeah, I love that comparison you made to the Patriots' dynasty bowing out in that game. The one person, though, that I found interesting was Greg Popovich after the game. He took his usual comedic route with reporters, and when asked about the streak ending, he simply responded, what streak? What are you talking about? And then later, also called the end of the storied playoff streak, fake news, doing his best President Trump impersonation. So definitely Popovich, a guy with a lot of class. And so as long as he is at the helm of the San Antonio Spurs, again, wouldn't count them out, and I will certainly be watching them. So moving on now to the MVP of the bubble, which the NBA recently decided it would award for plays or for a player that best performed for his team during the Orlando bubble period. And certainly, Rob, there are players from whom we have come to expect greatness. The likes of James Harden at 35 points per game, Giannis with 28 and 12, and especially Luka Doncic at 32, 11 rebounds and 11 assists have been absolutely outstanding down in Orlando. Yet just as the regular season MVP often capitalizes on a particular narrative, I think it's fitting and likely that the bubble MVP is awarded along similar lines. And Damian Lillard, I already talked about him, but he's led the Orlando bubble at 37.6 points per game including a 61-point outburst to match his career high against the Mavericks. In doing so, Lillard became the second player ever to record three 60-point games in a single season alongside the great Wilt Chamberlain. Though Lillard and the Blazers have been aided by outstanding performances from C.J. McCollum, who was playing with a fractured back, Mello, who hit another very clutch shot last night, Yusuf Nurkic, Hassan Whiteside and Gary Trent Jr. These last two weeks, I think, will ultimately reflect so positively on Damian Lillard's legacy and his status as an elite NBA point guard. And just as an aside, if I know one thing, it's that NBA 2K definitely did themselves a favor by making him the cover athlete of upcoming NBA 2K21, as he definitely has generated a whole lot of buzz these past couple weeks. Absolutely. I'm sure the 
the team over at 2K Sports is very happy with his performance and how that'll likely boost sales for them this fall as the game is prepared to be released. But while all the talk has been surrounding Dame, and rightly so, he's been absolutely sensational the past eight games. Um, and he's really transformed into a hero uh, of that city of Portland, being such a loyal player and a guy who will go to war for all of his teammates uh, in an NBA that has become more and more polarized and uh, centered around super teams. Dame is the one constant that you can count on to perform for his trailblazers that he's been with his whole career. As I said before, while the talk has been about him, I'd like to play a little devil's advocate and put the spotlight on Suns guard Devin Booker. He's arguably been as valuable, if not more so, to his team's success in the bubble uh, than Lillard has. Uh, Devin Booker has averaged almost 31 points across these eight games. He scored 35-plus in half of those. Um, and if you're talking about narratives, Booker led the Phoenix Suns to an 8-0 record uh, in the bubble. That's something the Lakers didn't do. The Bucks didn't do that. The Clippers didn't do that. The Phoenix Suns, a largely mediocre team for the past – decade all of a sudden stole the national spotlight and uh, stole the headlines in the NBA only to miss out to the Blazers. I, I, can't, I can't imagine being a player on the Suns. You do everything you possibly can. You don't lose a game in the bubble. Um, you're arguably the best team that came to Orlando despite being uh, a fringe playoff team at the start uh, and you can't get it done. It's, I feel terrible. I don't know how you know, I'd be able to get over that as a player. But I think the future definitely looks bright for the Suns. Hopefully Devin Booker sticks around um, and he can work with that young talent they have and, and make something special a few years down the line. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Just watching those Suns and watching Karis LeVert release that shot against the Blazers last night, I just imagined <laughs> I'm a Phoenix Suns player just sitting – in the hotel watching that shot and just the heartbreak that must have resulted in once it careened off the rim. But yeah, I mean, you said it. they did everything right on their part. Devin Booker at almost 31 a game was outstanding. He has come so far in terms of his playmaking as well as getting to the free throw line because he didn't even shoot it particularly well from three point range. And he's a dude who's always been known as a shooter in the NBA, but his offense has just developed to the point where I, you know, if I'm a Phoenix Suns, I'm Phoenix Sun. I'm confident putting the ball in his hand. And I think the more talent management can surround Booker with, the better that team is going to be. Because you look at their record, DeAndre Ayton, second year player, their record with DeAndre Ayton in the lineup was 20 and 18. So over 500 since he returned from that 20 or 25 game suspension for PED use. Um, so he was great. I think, you know, their role players, Cam Johnson, Campaign, Dario Sarge, Javon Carter, just to name a few, they were wonderful as well. And so, yeah, I think definitely awarding the MVP for the bubble to Devin Booker would be a sort of consolation prize, so to speak. But it, if I know anything about Devin Booker, it's that he has his eyes on more than just a consolation prize talking about next season. So now real quick, Rob, let's get into some rapid fire predictions for the first round of these NBA playoffs and no pressure intended on these, but just wondering what your gut tells you about each of these first round matchups. No need to elaborate if you choose not to, but let's hear your thoughts, starting with number one, Milwaukee against the eight seed Orlando Magic out East. Well, Aiden, hopefully I shouldn't have to explain myself all that much with this pick. I'm going to go Milwaukee in four games. Can't say too much about Orlando other than the fact that they've been a beneficiary of a very weak Eastern Conference. Um, the conference has been inferior to the West for the past decade. Uh, and I don't think Giannis should have a problem at all with dispatching a very young roster in Orlando. Yeah. Orlando what do you think of Orlando's a team that can't get over the hump, and so I've got Milwaukee 4 0 sweep just like that. Yeah, far too inexperienced to, to put up any sort of fight, but. I'd like to know what you think of the 2-7 matchup, the Raptors and the Nets. Oh, boy. Well, Brooklyn, they've definitely shown me something, and they have some players that could definitely chip in um, to next year's probably contending team with Kyrie and KD. 
But that said, Toronto with their championship pedigree, I see this going 4-0, maybe 4-1 if Brooklyn really puts together an effort like they did the other night against the Blazers. Yeah, I think even through the absence of Durant and Irving and Dinwiddie, uh, we've seen Brooklyn show some fight. We've seen Harris LeVert vault into the national scene. He, you're, we're seeing his uh, blossom into stardom in front of our own eyes. But uh, like you said, I can only see Brooklyn winning a game at most against a very experienced Toronto roster, Nick Nurse. Uh, all he's done is, is win since he's come to Toronto. He's uh, been able to do incredible things with his roster amidst all these changes. So I like Toronto. I'll say 4-0. I think uh, they won't lose that series. Um, but I think perhaps the most interesting first-round matchup in the East could be that Boston-Philadelphia 3-6 matchup. Um, a lot of heated moments between these two teams the past few seasons. The Boston-Philadelphia rivalry uh, spans across all sports. And I think that game could reach uh, six. You know, I, I'm ultimately going to pick Boston in this series. I think they're uh, a more balanced team. I think Philadelphia runs way too hot and cold. They're not as well coached. Um, and I don't think uh, their experience in big-time playoff matchups uh, can compare to that of the Celtics. I'm sure you have a very unbiased opinion on who you think will win that series, but I'd still like to hear it. Well, you know, bias aside, though, I think it's definitely worth keeping an eye on the Ben Simmons headline as we are yet to hear as to how long Simmons is going to be out. But word around the league is that he's going to be missing at least some of the playoffs, if not the entire rest of the season. So for me, Joel Embiid's a great player, but the pieces we talk about Al Horford playing alongside Embiid. It just hasn't worked out for the 76ers this year. And so, again, all bias aside, I've got Boston in five. Interesting. Yeah, the, uh, the Al Horford experiment has not gone particularly well for the Sixers. I think a lot of people were very confused that they didn't go with a, a 3 and D guard to fill out that uh, stacked starting lineup, especially when they had Jimmy Butler. But Philadelphia, I think they've transformed from the process to what could have been uh, because it, it doesn't – seem like they'll be uh, pinning themselves as championship contenders anytime soon. It's been uh, perennially underwhelming in my eyes. Um, but all uh, jokes aside about Philadelphia, let's move to the final series, Miami and Indiana, the seeding yet to be announced. Um, but the Heat and the Pacers, we've talked a little bit about them before with TJ Warren and Jimmy Butler, uh, kind of a sub-rivalry there, Miami, Indiana, uh, rivalry spanning back to the days of LeBron James and his arch nemesis, Lance Stevenson. Uh, this is a very difficult series to pick. Indiana is just one of those teams that always hangs around. Um, they lack star power, but they play together so well. And I'm going to pick them in seven. I think it'll be a fantastic series against the Heat, and it'll probably be one of the highlights of the first round. Yeah, I think seven games does not sound too far-fetched for this rivalry series. Um, it is worth noting, though, Sabonis is injured for Indiana and no sign of him returning anytime soon. So with that said, I'm going to pick the Heat, and I'm going to pick them in six, just behind the play of their all-stars, Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo. I don't think that the Pacers, as much size and strength as they have, can quite match up with those two. Though I will say they feature an elite backcourt in Victor Oladipo, who ultimately elected to play alongside Malcolm Brogdon, former Rookie of the Year. So I've got Miami in six, but I wouldn't be surprised to see seven, as you mentioned. All right, and moving on to the West, we have the 1-8 matchup yet to be determined. Uh, we have to see Portland and Memphis battle it out first, but whoever wins that many series will have to go up against LeBron James, a fully rested LeBron James, and Anthony Davis. And while I don't think the series will be particularly competitive, no matter who plays the Lakers, um, I'm rooting for a Portland-Los Angeles series, simply because I think Portland might be able to steal a game, uh, especially the way Damian Lillard and C.J. McCollum are playing. Yusuf Nurkic has been a huge, huge return 
for the Blazers. You could tell that they desperately need him throughout the regular season. Now that he's back, they're playing a much higher level of basketball. Uh, and finally, I think LeBron guarding Damian Lillard, something we ultimately might see if Dame gets hot, would be an epic matchup. It reminds me of, as a Bulls fan, LeBron guarding Derrick Rose in the 2011, I believe, Eastern Conference Finals when the Bulls and the Heat were the class of that conference and, and battling it out uh, every so often. So I would pick uh, the Lakers in five if they played Portland. I would pick the Lakers in four if they played Memphis. I don't think Memphis has any uh, reason to be in that spot. But LeBron v. Dame is something I would definitely root for uh, in this first round series. Yeah, I'm not going to comment too much on Lakers-Memphis if that's what ends up happening. I think that's a 4-0 sweep, enough said. Great as John Morant and Jonas Valanciunas are. Lakers-Portland would be interesting, and I'm rooting for that matchup as well. Frankly, I don't think those teams can guard each other. Um, I think we're going to see a high-scoring affair between those two teams, given that they sort of have a lot of scoring punch in each other's defensive weakness. Um, the Lakers are missing, for instance, Avery Bradley. And so without defensive oriented guards such as Bradley, how are you going to stop the likes of Lillard and McCollum? Um, I think Lakers in five is fair. I'm going to go so far as say Lakers in six, just because Portland definitely has that momentum right now. They're sort of working as the underdog and we know how much Dame Lillard likes to work as an underdog. So Honestly, that's going to be the first round series I keep my eyes on the most outside of my own rooting interests. Um, but yeah, I, I would go Lakers in six over Portland. How are you feeling about the other side of LA, the LA Clippers? Um, they have a 2-7 matchup against the Dallas Mavericks. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's a tough draw for the Lakers. I mean, Dallas as a seven seed is, is very intimidating, especially with the way Luke has been playing. He's averaging a triple-double, I believe. Um, mentioned earlier so he's been fantastic and Kristaps Porzingis but outside of those two I don't see a particularly deep roster and that's what the Clippers are perhaps the best in the league at having guys who can come off the bench and still produce and that's critical uh, especially come playoff time in a seven game series so uh, while I think Dallas has the, the talent and the star power to maybe steal a game or two uh, I'm going to go with the late or I'm sorry the Clippers in five, I think Kawhi and Paul George at the helm with Montres Harrell, Lou Williams, um, Landry Shamit, uh, Yvich Zubac uh, shortly behind. I, I think the Clippers are just far too deep to, to give up a lot of ground in that series, so I'm going to pick them in five. Yeah, this might surprise some people. I'm going to go Clippers in four. I think it's going to be a rude awakening for Luka Doncic in terms of what playoff basketball is all about. And that's not to say he's not going to put up his numbers. Um, he's obviously averaged the 32, 11, and 11 in the bubble restart. But, you know, I think Porzingis, he's a guy who's played great during the bubble himself. He's had multiple 30-point outings. Um, I don't think he's there yet in terms of a series against the Clippers. And I think it's going to be a sweep on their part. Um, I think, I think Luka could also get – uh, very easily frustrated being guarded by Paul George and Kawhi Leonard um, on and off throughout that whole series. You don't see Luca as a guy who loses his temper all too often, but uh, when you're against those two, you know, all pro caliber defenders, I think if you get under his skin a little bit and throw him off, he's still a very young player, got a lot to learn in terms of winning uh, with the Dallas Mavericks. So uh, I think Lake, I think Clippers in four could also be a very uh, real possibility. Yeah, I do expect Luca to take quite a physical toll in that series. And moving on to what should also be a very physical matchup, number three, Denver, number six, Utah. I don't love Utah, quite honestly. I like them as a team, but in this matchup, I see Denver winning in five, maybe six games. I think that Jokic is just doing his thing right now. And, you know, if Denver can heal up from the assorted injuries they've had, um, some of their guys – really alongside their newly polished offensive weapon, Michael Porter Jr. I don't think it's a contest. I think they just have too much scoring power to, um, or for Utah to compete with. So I would, I'm going to go Denver in six. I think that's a fair prediction. I'd pick Denver in five. I think they've had um, some playoff experience under their belt already the past few seasons, and they're ready to 
start taking that leap, even with a very top heavy Western conference. Um, I like the way their young guys have filled in. They're still running through Jokic and Jamal Murray. That's been their philosophy the whole time. They've just had pieces moving in and out and it's, and it's been able to work for them. And I think Denver, uh, although their run will stall out in the semifinals uh, of the West, I, they could very well push a team like the Lakers or the Clippers to six, maybe seven games if they're on. So I, I agree. Denver in six, five games is, is a fair assessment. And let's not forget uh, Denver, actually. They were minutes away from reaching the Western Conference Finals last season. It was really C.J. McCollum who came up with a big game in Game 7 to put them away. I remember watching that game. So they're a team that they have experience, and they've sort of run it back with the same guys with some new pieces added. So definitely, as you just alluded to, definitely a force to be reckoned with. And before we wrap up our NBA analysis for today, let's take a look at Houston and Oklahoma City. Uh, the seeding is yet to be determined in this matchup. Uh, you have Houston, um, a team who is, I guess, known for you know, being a very flashy regular season team and having their fair share of shortcomings during the postseason against a Thunder team who is very, very young with the exception uh, of, I guess, their captain, so to speak, Chris Paul. Now, Russell Westbrook is out for at least the first game, maybe the next game in that series. Eric Gordon is ailing. He'll still play, uh, but probably not to 100% of his ability. So while I still like Houston in this matchup, um, I'm willing to give Oklahoma City an extra game, maybe two, given that Westbrook is out and Eric Gordon uh, is not playing to his highest standard. So I'll say Houston in six uh, against the Thunder. Thunder have had an incredible season. We talked about Billy Donovan uh, being potentially deserving of coach of the year. He's done so well with that roster. Um, and they've really shown everyone what it means to play true team basketball and how successful you can be if you get everyone involved. Fair enough. Here's how highly I think of Russell Westbrook since the calendar flipped to 2020. No, let's say no Westbrook for this series. I've got OKC in six. Wow. If Westbrook plays, though, I've got a clean sweep on Houston's part. Wow. And that's as you mentioned, I don't think that he's not going to be ready. You know, he's a tough guy. He plays through injuries historically. But um, let's say that this injury never happened. I think that he could absolutely dominate a team even like OKC with their defensive guards. He's just been playing out of this world. And Houston's just a team that starting with both Westbrook and Harden, they really zip the ball around and know how to find their corner shooters. So OKC, it's just going to be a tough, tough matchup for them, especially because they like to play with players like Steven Adams and they would have to go small just to match up. Yeah. Westbrook, you know, he's so explosive. He's, he's, miles ahead of anyone uh, on that floor in terms of quickness and uh, ability to get to the hoop in a short amount of time. Um, but yeah, like I said before, if, you know, considering Westbrook's out, I'm willing to give the Thunder an extra game. Um, but if he's in there, I'd say Houston in five, uh, maybe four, like you said, but losing him hurts. You know, he's been a, a big part of that team and their success. Uh, I'm sure Houston will readily, uh, rely on James Harden for the duration of that series. Um, but I'm still excited to see Houston OKC. Okay, I'm sure there's going to be a little tension, given that Russell Westbrook is is on another team. But uh, it, it's a coin flip there, uh, in my opinion, you know, in terms of how it will go. Oklahoma City could uh, play upset and, you know, take Houston all the way, or, you know, Houston could really show that star power is above all uh, in today's NBA. and and really make an important Definitely. Playoffs right around the corner, and Rob and I are certainly here for it. And before we move on, do you ever find yourself thinking about sports while reflecting on your cherished Montserrat experience? Do your friends ever complain that all you talk about is sports? Most importantly, though, do you fully expect the Holy Cross Crusaders to win the next 10 Patriot League titles for every single sport? If your answer is yes to any of these questions, WCHC Sports has a place for you. For information on opportunities to broadcast, podcast, and everything in between, 
email wchtsports at g.holycross.edu today. So the Stanley Cup playoffs have officially begun, featuring especially a thrilling five-overtime game between the two-seed Lightning and the seven-seed Blue Jackets. And you know me, Rob, and you know that I've been so caught up in watching basketball these past couple weeks. So do me a favor and tell me just a little bit about what's been going on in the world of hockey and how the playoffs are shaping up thus far. Absolutely. And that, that 5 OT game between Tampa Bay and Columbus, you know, they almost played three games in one night, uh, which is absolutely astounding to me. There were a few guys that had almost 50 minutes of ice time. Um, I'm sure they were exhausted after that game. Um, but the NHL is back. The playoffs are right around the corner. The NHL playoffs are kind of a fan favorite among a lot of dedicated sports fans just because of how intense um, and fun those matchups can be. Uh, and there have been some surprise headlines uh, right out the gate in the first round. You know, we come back to the St. Louis Blues we talked about last week. Their bubble experience has been somewhat of a nightmare so far, considering they were a team that was in the first seed at the beginning of the NHL's postponement. They went 0 and 3 in the round robin stage, and they're now down 1 0 in their series against the Vancouver Canucks, a far less experienced squad. And game two tonight is likely a major turning point for the Blues in their title defense. They can't turn things around quickly, you know. You could see a 4-0, 4-1 victory for the Canucks. And that is something uh, I believe nobody expected. Uh, but on the other side of the bracket in the East, you have the Philadelphia Flyers, who were uh, fourth at the time of the NHL's postponement. And they've jumped all the way into first. They're undefeated in the bubble. They lead the Montreal Canadiens 1-0 in their series. They play again tonight. And, you know, as, and as I'm going to get to in a little bit, Hot teams are always a factor as the playoffs approach, no matter what seed they are. Uh, and the Flyers are embodying that as well as anyone has in the past few years. Yeah, and we sort of talked last week just about some of these mid-tier teams that have been leapfrogging up in the stand standings during the resumed season. And Philadelphia, they've perhaps best exemplified that trend because a year ago they were just a 500 team that barely missed out on the postseason, yet here they are with some real momentum and a roster that has sort of a nice mix of young talent and more experienced veterans. And if they're able to keep this going and make a legit push at the Stanley cup, it would be quite a turnaround to say the least. Absolutely. And I think in terms of contenders, the flyers are joined by uh, the Tampa Bay lightning. They've had a chip on their shoulder ever since last season when they won the president's trophy and got swept in the first round by the Columbus blue jackets who Coincidentally, they're playing in the first round. They're tied 1-1 in that series. I think another big storyline in the East is that series between the Boston Bruins and the Carolina Hurricanes, an Eastern Conference Finals rematch of last year. You know, these two teams have history. They're both very, very talented at the 4-5 matchup. And I think whoever wins that series, it's tied 1-1 right now, um, could very well make a run to the cup. They're both very balanced. Um, they can score, you know, in more ways than one. Uh, they're solid in net. They're solid on defense. Just well-rounded. Uh, and, you know, they, the winner of that series will face likely the New York Islanders, uh, maybe the Washington Capitals. I like the matchups for the Bruins and the Hurricanes against both of those teams. And moving on to the West, you have the Vegas Golden Knights, uh, another fantastic all-around team. Um, their defense has shut down the Chicago Blackhawks. They're up 2 nothing in that series. The Blackhawks were a team that looked like they could score at will in the qualifiers against the Oilers, um, but they've been somewhat silenced ever since against the Golden Knights. Um, and the Colorado Avalanche, uh, another team who greatly improved their position uh, in the round-robin bubble games, moving up to the second seed. They're up, uh, up one nothing in their series against the Coyotes uh, and their ability to score at will, perhaps better than anyone in the league, uh, will definitely be something to keep an eye on as we progress uh, throughout the Stanley Cup tournament. Yeah, and just I want to jump back to the Bruins real quick because I'm sure due to where we are based, Rob, we likely have some Boston sports fans listening to the podcast. And I personally don't think it's time yet to give up on a team like the Bruins, who obviously made a very deep postseason push in last year's playoffs. And though they've had 
sort of an inconsistent stretch heading into this year's playoffs. They're still a team with perhaps the best defense in the entire NHL. And as the adage goes, defense wins championships. And so now it's a matter of whether or not their ability to score the puck ends up picking up again. Absolutely. I, I think the Bruins are always going to be a team to watch in this postseason. Um, I think they have perhaps the best uh, three-man attacking line in the NHL with Marchand, uh, Pasternak, and Patrice Bergeron. They were very quiet in their round-robin games when they went 0-3. The three of them combined only had one assist. Uh, but in these first two games of their series against the Hurricanes, they really come back into their form and uh, put Boston's offense on another level. So they're, they're certainly a team to watch out for and not disrespect, um, even considering their, their struggles in the round robin. So now we're going to move on to Major League Baseball. And the top story from this past week was yet another brawl involving the Houston Astros. This time it's uh, the division rival Oakland A's. And it started with outfielder Ramon Laureano of the Athletics getting hit by Astros pitching three times in two games. He was clearly frustrated on his way down to first base and later received some choice words from Astros hitting coach Alex Cintron that will not be repeated on this program. Uh, Cintron also made a move towards Laureano as if he was instigating a fight, which prompted the Oakland outfielder to make a beeline toward the Astros dugout before he was eventually tackled and subdued by a crowd of Astros players. Now, it was interesting that Cintron, the guy who instigated the fight and called out Laureano, kind of snuck behind a wall of Astros players as Laureano was charging him. You know, it's, you think back to the, uh, the adage, you know, he can talk the talk and he walked the walk. And he seemed uh, a little standoffish considering and he was the one that started the whole incident. But it's yet another brawl with the Astros, another heavy-handed response from Major League Baseball. Alex Cintron was suspended for 20 games, so Laureano was suspended for six. And I think this really shows their limited tolerance for brawls and similar close encounters like this between teams um, in the age of COVID-19. They've dealt with their fair share of problems with this virus already. I'm sure it's caused a lot of scheduling headaches uh, and a lot of PR headaches for the league. And I think every time this happens with the Astros or any other team, the response from the MLB is going to be very heavy handed and uh, no nonsense. And let's talk real quick about those suspensions that you just made note of. So it led to suspensions with Cintron receiving 20 games and an undisclosed fine for inciting and escalating the conflict. But meanwhile, Laureano got hit with a six-game suspension and also an undisclosed fine for charging the dugout. And you and I have both seen the video of the fight. I actually just rewatched it this morning. Um, and as mentioned during the live telecast, from the MLB's perspective, this is just about the last thing that the league wants happening right now with everything going on in sports and in the world. So... I got to ask for your opinion on this, Rob. Do you think that they got the suspensions right? And do you think it's possible that these suspensions may have been specifically issued with a 60-game shortened season in mind as opposed to the 162-game slate that we are all used to? You know, I, given the MLB's stance on how much they want to limit these interactions between players, I don't completely disagree with these suspensions handed out to Laureano and Cintron. I believe Cintron was absolutely the person in the wrong considering what he said to Laureano, you know, the comments involving his mother, um, and ultimately, like you said, inciting and escalating the conflict. Um, it's a massive suspension for a coach. There's only been a few times where uh, a staff member has been suspended for 20 games or more. Um, but I think it's indicative of the times we're in. You know, I, MLB does not want to deal with any more COVID-19 problems. And, you know, nonsense like this can only exacerbate the issue they've been experiencing. I don't think they were issued with a 60-game season in mind. Joe Kelly, the Dodgers pitcher who threw at a few Astros batters, was suspended for eight games, which is, you know, almost 10 per, more than 10% of the season. Uh, in no way he'd be suspended for, I guess, to be 16 games in a normal season for throwing at a guy. 
Um, so I think it, it really doesn't have anything to do with um, the proportionality of the games being played from one season to the next. It's, it's more so the MLB making a statement um, and coming down hard on uh, actions that go against their COVID-19 protocol. And speaking of statements from the MLB, the commissioner, at least according to him, states the MLB has not really entered into crisis mode yet in terms of COVID-19, but the league is yet to shake the pandemic and its impact as the NBA and NHL have been able to do in their respective bubbles. First, we saw it was the Marlins, and now we're seeing the St. Louis Cardinals dealing with a team-wide outbreak as they have not yet taken the field since July 29th, so a couple of weeks now. And as of Thursday, August 13th, 30 games have been postponed as a result of COVID, and there are reports that the MLB is strongly considering moving to a bubble format for the postseason, though it is worth noting that the league's player association has voiced its objections to creating such a bubble. But most of the positive tests in the MLB do appear to be travel-related, so it's certainly worth keeping an eye on the story as it develops. Yeah, you're right, Aiden. And going back to the Marlins, they're set to kick off their home and opener uh, in Miami today against the Braves. Uh, you know, it's their first home game all season. They played about 12 games. And the Cardinals are slated to play their first game in almost three weeks uh, this Saturday in a doubleheader against the White Sox. St. Louis has to play 55 games in 43 days now to ensure they'll finish out the regular season. Uh, and I think it'll be very interesting to see not only how they manage their COVID issues that they're, they have been dealing with and still need to deal with throughout this next week, but um, see how they can manage such a rigorous schedule and you know, switching guys in and out and giving players adequate rest uh, as well. I think that'll be a major point uh, of interest for that team going forward. But now let's shift our focus to some of the hottest teams and players about a third of the way through the season. Uh, one of the biggest questions or storylines coming into the shortened 60 game season was could someone hit for a 400 batting average? And although we're, you know, only about a third of the way through, we're seeing Rockies outfielder Charlie Blackman hitting a ridiculous 472 through 18 games so far. He's tallied 34 hits and just 72 at bats. And Blackman would be the first player to bat 400 in 79 years um, if he was able to do this when. Uh, you go back to Red Sox legend Ted Williams hitting 406 in 1941. Now the news around the league, Dodgers outfielder Mookie Betts had a superb performance on Thursday night. He hit three home runs uh, in a game, while Angels outfielder Mike Trout has had seven home runs in nine games since becoming a father. Bit of, a, bit of an uplifting storyline for you there, Aiden. Yeah, and I definitely got a kick out of the Mike Trout headline um, the seven home, run, home runs in nine games. And sports fans might recall Fred Van Vliet, actually. His nightmare starts the 2019 playoffs, in which he shot just 25% from the field in the first two rounds in Toronto's championship pursuit. But after the birth of his son, Freddie Jr., however, Van Vliet was just cooking from three-point range. And many would argue that the Raptors would not have emerged victorious from their Milwaukee se uh, series or perhaps even their Golden State series, if not for the play of Van Vliet following the birth of his son. So definitely reminiscent, reminiscent of that in what we see from Trout. So lastly, Rob, let's move on to just a little bit of football. So big news this week as Holy Cross alum Jackson Dennis was signed to the New York Giants. And Dennis, an offensive lineman who played for Holy Cross 2015 through 2019, was an undrafted free agent who signed with the Arizona Cardinals in April of this year, but was released in late July as the Cardinals trimmed their roster. But it sure looks like he's back in the mix for the time being, though he projects as just a practice player for now. His size at right tackle makes him certainly worth a look from NFL coaches as he stands six foot seven and 308 pounds. And his 12 start senior year, led to his selection to Phil Steele's All-Patriot League second team. So definitely props to Jackson Dennis on this news coming in Holy Cross Athletics this past week. Absolutely. It's, it's wonderful to see, you know, a Holy Cross alum enter the sports world like that. You don't see too many of them 
And Dennis arrived at Holy Cross in 2015. He medical registered his sophomore season, but he definitely grew uh, and got a lot bigger throughout his time on the Hill. He was 6'5 and 250 pounds as a freshman. Uh, and he joins the likes of uh, offensive lineman Jimmy Murray of the New York Jets and wide receiver Khalif Raymond of the Tennessee Titans as Crusaders currently in the NFL. But now we transition to college football uh, and some of the news surrounding their hopes to restart amidst COVID-19. The Big Ten and Pac-12 moved this past week to cancel all fall sports while the SEC, ACC, and Big 12 continue to work having a football season. And this news was met only a few days later by NCAA President Mark Emmert announcing that there would be no Division I championships this fall, with the exception of college football, which is currently looking for a viable way to play games and schedule a season ending in a title game. And uh, Aiden, I'm sure you are not surprised that football is still on the table considering that uh, they are by far the biggest moneymaker for the NCAA. But uh, to finish, due to all this uncertainty surrounding coronavirus and college sports, the NCAA Division I Council recently proposed that athletes who do not play this season or opt out before playing more than half of the games they have could potentially retain their 2020 eligibility, um, which is a measure that will eventually be voted on by the Board of Governors next week. And if it's passed, it could provide much needed flexibility for students across the country. Yeah, you're absolutely right about certain conferences holding out hope um, for some sort of season as football and men's basketball are known as revenue sports in the NCAA. So obviously it's in teams and colleges best interest to put teams out on the court or field if at all possible. But ultimately I do think that the health and safety of players and fans, coaches, et cetera, um, will be the determining factor. But if passed, um, you know, the measure that will be voted on by the board of governors about eligibility, if passed, it would definitely mark a positive development for college athletes but it remains to be seen how it would impact athletes at smaller schools, kind of like Holy Cross, who typically complete their studies after just four years. So only time will tell what sort of an impact it has, um, again, for those smaller school athletes. Absolutely. And we'll keep you guys updated on all the recent news uh, in that situation and what the NCAA plans to do moving forward. But for now, let's get to our assists, fumbles, and what to watch for. Sure, Rob. So assist of the week for me goes to a few individuals from the ranks of Holy Cross coaching. So Holy Cross women's hockey coach Katie LaChapelle, men's hockey coach David Berard, and men's basketball coach Brett Nelson have partnered with Holy Cross Athletics on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook over these past couple of weeks on the school's hashtag wear a mask initiative. And each coach has been featured in a video short highlighting the importance of wearing a mask and practicing social distancing as a means of combating COVID-19. So I don't know about you, but as a Holy Cross student, I certainly appreciate these coaches' willingness to engage with the general student body, albeit in a remote fashion, on such an important issue. For sure. It's definitely encouraging to see prominent members of our Holy Cross community remain committed to the safety of student-athletes, even with sports drawn to a saddening and unfortunate halt on Mount St. James. Definitely. And moving on, you know what they say, for every highlight, there is somewhere a low light. And Seattle Seahawks rookie cornerback Kima Siverand has been released by the team following an unfortunate yet undeniably humorous incident. Siverand, an undrafted player out of Oklahoma State, was caught on video sneaking a woman into a hotel where the Seahawks were staying isolated during training camp. Though it was certainly a questionable decision for any pro athlete in the midst of a global pandemic, it was really the way Siverand attempted to sneak the woman in that has been drawing headlines all over. He attempted to disguise the woman as a Seahawks player by having her dress head to toe in team gear. Needless to say, it did not work out for the pair. Presumably the woman was not, say, a six, seven lineman. Um, 
may have had something to do with it. And the undrafted rookie is now unfortunately out of a job. You know, Aiden, it's, it's a hilarious story, but do you know if the woman that was trying to sneak in, when you say team gear, are you saying like a sweatshirt and sweatpants with a logo on her, or was she fully decked out with, you know, helmet, shoulder pads, cleats? Cause I think that would be a pretty hilarious uh, image if the Seahawks player gave a, a stranger some gear and tried to sneak her into his hotel. You know, either way, I just want to see the video. It's not yet been released, but I think it would definitely give, give us something to laugh about again, unfortunately at his expense, but at least he was thinking, I guess, not sure. Yeah, it was a, a valiant effort on his part. And we, the people need to see that video at all costs. Uh, but you know, all, uh, jokes aside, we have Bucks forward Giannis Antetokounmpo being recently suspended for one game uh, for headbutting Wizards forward Mo Wagner after getting called for an offensive foul on Wednesday night. Giannis was suspended for the Bucks' final regular season game against the Grizzlies, and while he later apologized, it was rather surprising to see a lovable, respected star like Giannis, who's still very young, at an early stage in his career, make such a poor decision. Um, I believe not only was it a pretty classless move, but it was ill-advised as well. The Bucks are the number one team in the East. They have championship aspirations. And any playoff games without their potential two-time MVP would make hoisting the Larry O'Brien trophy a much harder goal to realize. Yeah, I agree, Rob. And personally, like I'm a Giannis fan. Um, I think he's a super hardworking, respectable guy. And I think that's what makes this headbutting incident all the more shocking. Um, I agree with you in that it was a classless move. And let's not forget in the midst of all this, who really stood to suffer from this. And that's the Phoenix Suns. Um, you know, I'm not saying it's likely that Mike Budenholzer would have chosen to play Giannis in the team's regular season finale against Memphis, but that suspension meant no Giannis on the court. And so Memphis easily ran away with that game and secured their own spot in the playoffs. Whereas, say, Budenholzer chose to play Giannis and Middleton for even just a half, it definitely would have made it more of an uphill battle for Memphis to win that game against the number one team in the league. And then you're looking at Phoenix possibly not dealing with the 8-0 miss, to the, miss of the playoffs like we're seeing right now. Yeah, it was a bit of a cruel twist of fate uh, in that regard that the Suns you know, could have been in and made that 8-0 run uh, all the more worthwhile. But you know, Giannis just had to go and headbutt a guy, and the week only gets worse for Suns fans. Yeah, and so now moving on to what to watch for. For me, for the first time ever, we have a well-rested LeBron James entering the NBA playoffs. Time and time again, we have seen LeBron, who is now 35 years old, take his game to new heights come playoff time. And after missing last year's postseason in large part due to that persisting groin injury, this is perhaps LeBron's best remaining shot at winning ring number four. And I personally cannot wait to see how he sets the tone against the Blazers or Grizzlies. He has officially led the NBA this season in assists for the first time in his career. So I'm wondering if we're going to see pass first LeBron or drop 40 on your head every night, LeBron. Who knows? We might see both. Um, but I, I couldn't agree more with you. I think the excitement surrounding uh, LeBron this postseason uh, is perhaps at an all-time high, given that he might be with one of his best supporting casts he's ever had uh, in Anthony Davis. And we discussed the potential of a, a Blazers-Lakers series earlier on in the podcast and how uh, exciting that would be to see Damian Lillard, a guy who is the hottest player in the league right now, go up against LeBron, the, the best player of the last decade or two. Um, but moving from the court to the golf course, my uh, player to watch for was Colin Morikawa, the winner of the 2020 PGA Championship, shooting a final round 64 six under with four birdies, an eagle, and zero bogeys. A phenomenal performance from a guy who was only 23 years old and playing in just his second major championship. Uh, it's his third tour win in just his 28th appearance. And as the fifth-ranked golfer in the world right now, 
his future in the game is extremely bright. And I've heard him uh, hailed in comparison to a very young Tiger Woods in terms of how early his success has come. Now, it's going to be a long hill to climb to, to see if he can get to the level Tiger is, but uh, it's always uh, electrifying to the game to see a young, talented golfer take the stage and, and dominate it like the way Morikawa did. So that's going to do it for us at WCHC Sports. Thank you for tuning in to week three of the podcast. We will be here same time next week. And we would also like to express our condolences to any current Holy Cross students struggling with the college's decision to remain online for fall 2020.